Okay. Sorry for the bit of delay. Um, it's kind of working. I've had a little bit of technical troubles, two technical troubles. One is that I couldn't find my proper presentation that I prepare for this, so I'm doing a presentation that I had uh, done in Mexico. All right. And secondly, uh, I'm doing, I couldn't, I can't actually see that. Oh, I, it's actually working now. I've, we've solved that problem. Okay. I'm seeing the same thing on my computer as this. All right. So my name is Dr. Tushar Mehta. Was anybody in my last talk, the nutrition talk that I did? Yes. I hope you guys liked it. Thank you. Um, all right. So I thought I'd just get a little bit of an idea of the audience. Um, how many people here are vegan? Cool, right? Veg? Right on. And interested? Maybe not, not yet, but interested? Cool, all right, that's good. People are shy sometimes to say that, all right. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about me. I'm a physician, that's my background training, but prior to that I've also you know, studied a lot of science and whatnot, and I've long time been interested in environmental issues amongst other things. All right. So over time, I started learning about the science behind um, animal agriculture and the impact on the planet. All right. Um, that's me. By the way, I'm from Toronto. And some other things that I do, I do some international health work. I do medical work, but I also do a lot of, um, I work in India and I've worked in a couple of countries in Africa doing sort of um, medical work as well. And... Um, and I do a lot, I've done work with environmental organizations. Anybody heard of Sea Shepherd Conservation Society? Yeah, so I've worked with Sea Shepherd. I've, did, I've done uh, some work with them in the Antarctic. All right. Now, as we get on, how many of you have heard of this movie, Cowspiracy? Who's heard of Cowspiracy? So, and who's watched it? Most people have watched it. Who's not watched it yet? Okay, so, okay, great. So it's a great movie to watch, and a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about are going to be familiar to you, um, because most of you have seen this movie, but I'm going to go a little bit more in depth in terms of how some of the things work, how, what some of the mechanisms are by which animal agriculture impacts the environment, okay, and what are some of the sciences. Now, one of the things I like to do is I like to make sure that everybody has a reference of what I'm talking about, because I can come and say anything about environmental issues but it may or may not be true. We see all kinds of things on the internet, etc. cetera. Um, but I want everybody to have my references, okay? So my name is Tushar, that's my first name, Tushar, and Meta is my last name, Tushar Meta. If you Google Dr. Tushar Meta, vegan diet and health, you'll find a video on YouTube, okay? That's my 2014 video on YouTube, from which you can see my video about nutrition, but you can also download all the references that I use for my nutrition talk, but also all the references that I use for this talk. There's an increasing amount of interest and information about the impact of animal agriculture on the environment. And a lot of this is from United Nations publications. That's where you get a lot of data from. So my references include a lot of United Nations uh, publications, as well as other organizations um, that, uh, like universities and other institutes that publish um, uh, papers about environmental issues are starting to talk about the impact of animal agriculture, okay? So even people like Bill Gates, you know, mainly became uh, a vegan for food security and environmental reasons, all right? So, you know, there, there is a lot more awareness of this and it's growing, okay? But it's still not enough awareness about it, okay? So we're gonna talk about how this happens. Why does animal agriculture have an impact on the environment? So let's start with some really basic things. How are animals fed? Because you've got to feed an animal to grow that animal, okay? So mostly, there, there's, there's two predominant ways, and one is we grow food to then feed to animals to eat. So we grow grains, we grow soy, we grow oil seeds. Oil seeds are basically the stuff that we get oil from. Let's say you take a bunch of seeds, you press them, and you get oil from them. Well, the leftover seeds or the seeds unpressed are actually fed to animals. So that's what animals predominantly eat when we feed them in our factory farms or even in non-factory farms, they're, they're fed these things, okay? In fact, 90 to 95% of the world's soy is actually fed to animals to grow the animals and then produce animal foods to feed back to humans. The second major way that animals, are eat, that animals eat is through grazing, okay? So animals graze on land. So Natural land, which may be a forest or a wetland or something like that, or even grasslands, are converted into pasture. 
So we may think that like there's all these uh, grasslands out there and animals feed on them naturally. That's not true. Once you put our domesticated animals on those grasslands, that dramatically alters that environment. And sometimes the environment is destroyed to preferentially grow the type of, uh, the type of uh, grasses or foods that, animals will eat, that our animals will eat, okay? that, uh, that our domesticated animals will eat. So that's the two ways of feeding animals. Okay? Now there's a basic problem here. Because we all know that if I... You know, if I eat a kilogram of food, I don't gain a kilogram. Or maybe in the food that I eat, uh, I have a kilogram of protein over, let's say, a, a few weeks or something like that. I eat a kilogram of protein, maybe over a couple of weeks or three weeks. I don't gain a kilogram myself. Because part of the energy and everything that we use in the foods is used for our metabolism. And if we have growing children, of course, I'm not growing really anymore, but if you have growing children, you know you don't eat, you know, feed them a certain amount of food and they grow the same number, amount of weight. There's a percentage of that is converted into their own body weight and a percentage of it that's used for you know, their own metabolism, basically. Just the body process converted to energy and converted into proteins that are used and then degraded and all kinds of things happen inside the body. Okay? So when it comes to growing animals for, you know, using food to grow animals, you're feeding maybe four to six kilograms of plant protein to make, you know, one kilogram of chicken protein. Now, that's under the most optimal, optimal circumstances. And those are the stats you can get from some things, but those stats may even not be accurate. They may be overestimating the amount of uh, you know, the, the ratio, the feed conversion ratio, okay? So the, the feed conversion ratio is the amount of plant food that you have to feed to an animal to grow that animal. And uh, that may be more favorable, but it may take, you know, six kilograms, may take 10 kilograms in some cases of plant foods to grow that one kilogram of chicken. Okay, so there's different scenarios and different conditions in which animals are grown and different genetics of the chickens themselves. Okay, same for the pig flesh and for the cow flesh, it's even the worst feed con conversion ratio. Okay, three to four kilograms of plant protein for one kilogram of milk and uh, sorry, three kilo, yeah, uh, for one kilogram of milk protein and three or four kilograms of plant protein for one kilogram of egg protein, okay? And those are under the most favorable conditions, okay? Now, how do you get the most favorable conditions? The animal should not be allowed to move because that burns calories, um, should be given hormones, and should be genetically modified. Now, genetic, modif genetic modification doesn't just include the genes that we insert through modern genetic modification, but it also means breeding. All these species of chickens and, and pigs and everything that we use have been bred over time to gain more weight quicker and have high, higher levels of hormones and all those kind of things to grow faster. But then we also put them in factory farms. We also feed them uh, hormones in some cases in some countries, maybe not so much here, but in the US. But they have a lot more of their own hormones that make them grow faster because of the breeding that's happened over uh, centuries, basically. Okay. And uh, we give them antibiotics and all kinds of things to be able to survive in those intense conditions in which we're making them to grow faster. So that's a feed conver conversion ratio. And you can see there's a waste, all right? Even under the most optimal circumstances, let's say I'm able to have four kilograms of uh, plant protein to one, kilo to, sorry, f to one kilogram of animal protein, there's three kilograms of waste going on there. So that's one of the major forms of waste that occurs in food production in the world. Now to, use, now, to basically grow that amount of food, we're going to use more land. We're going to use more water, more soil, more pesticides, more antibiotics, more of everything to be able to get the same amount of food that can then go into a human. Okay? And it takes a much smaller amount to grow plant protein directly, and therefore there's a loss of efficiency, and there's a waste that's going on there. Okay? Now, this is a key document that came out in 2006, very famous, called Livestock's Long Shadow, published by the United Nations, talking about the environmental impact of animal agriculture on the world, recognizing that the world's population is growing, and on a per capita basis, people are consuming more animal products. Developing countries which ate very little meat are now starting to become higher income and have higher income populations. They're consuming more meat. And what is the net environmental impact on the planet? So this is the first document that really came out. Now their solution to this, they didn't say we should eat more plants. They sort of said, oh, we have to figure out something. And they don't really quite know what. They thought maybe some technological innovation will happen or something like that. But it was kind of pressing. I think what happens also is that the authors of these things know that we kind of have to eat more plants and less meat, but they're not necessarily allowed to say it but they put all the information together as well, okay? So in summary, just in short, now we're gonna go into more depth, but animal agriculture is the number one cause of worldwide deforestation, 
okay? Forest products like deforestation to get pulp, paper, and wood products and stuff like that is the second major cause. It's also a major cause. But the first major cause is deforestation because we have to cut down all these forests in order to make farms for either grazing or to grow food that we then feed back to animals, all right? The second is wetland loss because we, we drain the wetlands, which are areas just like forests of high biodiversity, we drain the wetlands and then convert them into pasture or farms to grow food to feed animals. Grassland changes. When we, we, you know, when we use for grazing, it changes the grassland and, and imp impacts that environment. Soil erosion and desertification. It's the number one worldwide cost of soil erosion. That's not something you hear about as much as climate change, but it's something that's equally critical. Fresh water consumption. That's our biggest use of water. Extinction of land animals, so birds and all kinds of, you know, whether it's frogs and all kinds of land animals. Animal agriculture is the number one cause of extinction. Extinction of fish and ocean animals. And it's either the number one or number two cause of climate change, depending on who you listen to. And I know I'm going to go with the number two cause. It's the number one use of worldwide antibiotics. And uh, number one cause of nitrogen phosphorus use in fertilizer and uh, therefore the fertilizer and stool of animals running into the, into the water. So it's the number one cause of, of that pollution as well. We use over 65 billion animal, land animals per year for human consumption. Now by 2050 or so, that's supposed to double with current trends. That means over 2,000 animals killed per second. And over one trillion fish are killed per year. The number may be two or even three trillion. It's hard to estimate. They estimate by sort of weight of fish that are reported by countries and uh, in terms of just taking from the oceans. But there's often underreporting and under underestimation of that. But even if there's a trillion fish killed per year, that's 30,000 fish per second that are being consumed. About the same amount as plastic bags used by humans. Now let's talk about the world population. In the 1800s, there was a, you know the world finally reached a billion. Uh, humans in po po uh, population in 1800, okay? And that's after like, you know, thousands of years, we'd reached a billion. And by 1930, it was 2 billion, 1963 billion, 1974, 4 billion, 1987, 5 billion, 99, 6 billion. It's getting to about 15 years and we add a billion people to the planet. That's how fast our population is growing right now. So, you know, 2013 is 1.7 billion. Now, you know, we're talking about 7.4, sorry, 7.1 billion. Now we're talking about 7.4 billion or so on the Earth right now when we're having this presentation, okay? And what's the maximum population that the world will, will reach? Uh, you know, a lot of people say, oh, 9 billion is that thing. But that's sort of the lower end of the spectrum. If everything went in certain direct, you know, certain ways, we might sort of max out at a population of 9 billion. But there's different scenarios of what might happen with the human population on Earth. And some, seri you know, when you look at some documents on this, they give you sort of three estimates. What's the high version, middle version, and low version, you know? And on the high version, it's around 16 billion, like maybe by, you know, uh, um, the year 2100 or so, you know, we might, or, or 2150, we might max out at 16 billion. The lowest it can go is 9 billion, but that's unlikely, and probably ending up somewhere in between, all right? And now as the world eats meat, and people eat meat, and also developing countries, and you know, lower income people, their income gets better, then meat consumption increases there too, all right? And population growth, basically, if you take the number 70 and divide it by a percentage, so if I take, if I have something that grows at 2% per year, let's say I have 2% interest in my bank account, and I divide the number 70, by two, that means 35 years. In 35 years, my bank account will double. And so when you have countries all over the world that grow, like there's a lot of countries, a lot of like US, Canada, and other countries that grow by like about 1% per year. So that means in roughly 70 years, we will double our population. If the Canadian population, which is a very high consuming population in terms of the world you know, population, then we double, you know, or the US doubles its population by growing at about rough 1% in 70 years, that's adding a lot of burden to the planet, not in terms of our, just in terms of our diet, but everything that we do, all right? Um, so obviously this was a stat from Mexico, I was talking about, you know, the Mexican population growth rate and, and you know, how fast will they, uh, w how long will it take for it to double? And when we look at the Africa as a continent, when we look at the USA, we look at India, China, and look at the percentage by which the country grows, India grows by just under 2%, but that means in less than 35 years, it can double its population, right? Now, obviously that percentage of growth is changing, but population is still growing very fast because you're starting with a high base as well, okay? So 
and our per capita consumption, right, by 1961, people consumed about three, you know, yeah, 3.1 billion people consuming about 23, ki 20, 23 kilograms of meat, five kilograms of egg per year. In 2011, you had seven billion people, but on the average on the planet, people are eating 43 kilograms of meat and 10 kilograms of eggs per year. So that's in 50 years, you know, there's a four times increase in the amount of meat and eggs consumed. You can see how this growth is, is pretty big. Okay. And a very interesting statistic, there's a professor called Vaclav Smil, he's from, from uh, Canada, and he, he says that, okay, so if you, if you look at the weight of, and he uses the dry weight with water removed, I'm not sure why he does that, but he gives the calculation in various ways. But if you look at in 2000, uh, the year 2000 data, there was about 125 million tons of humans. If you took all the humans and put them on a scale, right, there was about 125 million tons of humans, okay? And there was about six, you know, there was about 6.1 billion people on the planet at that time, okay? And, um, and there was about 280 million tons of livestock at that time, okay? And if you take, you know, and so the, if you took all the wild animals all the, that were la on land, like all the, the, the birds and frogs and elephants and snakes and everything, all wild animals taken together, and put them on a scale, there was only 10 million tons of land vertebrates, not counting insects, 10 million tons. So humans outweighed them by more than 12 times in the year, uh, in that year. And, um, and, and you look at livestock, so if you take livestock plus all the humans and put all their weight on one scale, and you look at it, you know, compared to uh, the amount of animals that are on the planet, you can see that we outweigh them by so much. Now we're even a higher population, and the w population of wild animals has been decreasing very quickly due to human activity. And, you know, wild animals make up only 1%, roughly, of the biomass, and 99% of the biomass of vertebrates, of animals, of, you know, is humans and their livestock. And so, basically, we are consuming, like, everything on the planet, okay? So, you know, humans, uh, you know, Populations in different countries increase for different reasons, you know, because basically reproduction, uh, human migration, and those are sort of the, 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 the factors in terms of human population growth in countries and also worldwide, okay? Um, for example, in rich countries, uh, there may be a lower birth rate, but there's more migration, right? And, and so forth due to various factors. And so all these countries grow, and when these, these well-to-do countries, these richer countries grow, they have a relatively much higher impact. Okay, so now to feed the world population, because there was a lot of, you know, hunger-related problems all over the world, okay, in the 1940s to 70s, there was this sort of this green revolution, where all of a sudden we, you know, we had so many people like in different countries that didn't get enough food, but we were able to, you know, increase our food production drastically during this time, using fertilizers, pesticides, machinery, you know, industrial agri agriculture uh, methods, uh, and spreading those around. Irrigation from, uh, you know, better irrigation methods, you know, pumping from the ground and pumping from rivers and lakes and all these kind of things. A worldwide energy boom using fo fossil fuels. We were able to grow more food. And the other thing is that we did that was that we have, like, this guy Norman Borlaug, who was a key person. He won the Nobel Prize, and he's considered the man who saved a billion lives because he created strains of wheat and rice that were disease-resistant and drought-resistant, okay? And these were planted all over the world, basically enabling us to grow more food in a smaller amount of land using less water and having, you know, resistance to disease. And he also commented when he won his Nobel, Nobel Prize and afterwards saying that, listen, I've, I've done this, this work. Thank goodness we're able to feed more people, less people starving. That's good. But if we don't control our population growth, we're going to have a problem in terms of feeding the world. And uh, so now we have different technologies as well, like GMO and new chemicals and stuff like that, but it still is not going to really solve the problem. So when we talk about intersectionality, you know, and we talk about compassion, we talk about health, we talk about environmental issues, but also these social issues and the way that humans manage themselves and determine what our combined future is going to be, right? And how we're going to um, in, in things like sustainable development and uh, global trade and all these kind of things come into play here, okay? So, you know, animals are genetically engineered through breeding. Breeding is the main source of genetic engineering. If you see all these straight, you know, if you see all these species of dogs or breeds of dogs, for instance, you see all these little poodles and chihuahuas, you see big huskies, you see all kinds of different dogs, vastly different from each other, but part of the same species. They never existed in nature. Only through breeding them did we create all these different species. 
There was never any such thing as a cow in the past. There was no animal as a cow. Cow has come into existence, and all the different varieties of cow have come into existence through humans breeding an original animal called the Iraq, which is now extinct. But through breeding that animal, we created these species of cows and domesticated them. Same thing with chickens, which is bred from the wild jungle fowl and bred into all kinds of varieties uh, that probably most of them wouldn't survive in the wild, but they never existed. You know, the wild jungle fowl laid 30 eggs per year, but chickens are bred now to lay over 300 eggs per year. You know, and cattle, you know, pig, chickens grow far faster and have higher feed conversions than any natural animal ever did. You know, the, the original animals did. And as, you know, as a result, they have, their, they have lots of their own, you know, powerful hormones and everything like that, just without giving them any extra hormones to be able to do that. They're genetically bred to have these qualities, okay? And some of these animals, like, you know, farmed turkeys can't even reproduce naturally. And intensive factory farming is by far the most efficient way to grow animals for humans to eat. These animals can't move, they can't you know, um, burn calories, and we can control every aspect of their feeding and their life to maximize growth, give them antibiotics and give them specific types of feed and all kinds of stuff. And obviously, um, it is the, um, it's the mo takes the least resources, therefore least impact on the environment, although there's some things that may happen more, there may be more antibiotic use, et cetera, but overall, uh, less resources. And when we, br when we graze animals, so this so-called idea of free-ranged, organic and whatnot, that takes vastly more resources, water and land, especially land. That's the biggest thing that we use that has the greatest environmental impact. Okay. So in places like the United States, 70% of the United States land is actually used for animal agriculture. It's drastic. Okay. And that percentage is high pretty much all over the world. So how do we feed the future population, right? Um, you know, our Population will increase and hopefully we'll learn how to stabilize the human population in a really, you know, elegant and humane way, of course. Um, but food security is an issue in the meantime. And in the meantime, as somebody like myself who works in developing countries, um, I'm always concerned about how do we feed everybody such that all the children that I go out to work with have enough nutritional food to grow up and be healthy themselves, right? And food waste is a big issue. Approximately in, in developing countries and in the West, 30% of all food is wasted. So that's a big issue in terms of trying to, you know, uh, create uh, a lower Im environmental impact and have more food available. But also, animal agriculture is one of the, is even a bigger issue. You know, and biofuels is a really big issue as well. You know, an additional four billion people could be fed if we took all the food that was fed to animals and instead used it for human consumption. Now we don't have an extra four billion people to feed. So really what would happen is we would just use less land and allow a lot of the land to grow back into forest or return into wetland or some kind of natural condition that's good for the environment. And also, you know, magically all that food doesn't, you know, appear on the plates of people who need it. You know, there's a lot of things like uh, trade inequity, you know, sort of racism that's worldwide and, um, you know, all kinds of systems that are in place that are still, you know, have to be improved to be able to get the food to the right people. But, you know, just having that food, you know, the conversion from animal to plant food directly is, is one big factor in able to, being able to feed more people, okay? And uh, according to the United Nations, this is a United Nations 2010 report, you know, 50% of all the crops that are grown are actually fed to animals to then feed back to humans. So that's a lot. And 70% of all human land that is used is um, for animal agriculture, all of uh, the... Um, uh, you know, of all the land that humans use, that's a big percentage. And, um, and we talked about grazing, okay? So basically a third, one third of the non-frozen surface of the earth is basically used for animal agriculture. It's the single biggest thing that we use for, uh, it's the single biggest human impact on the land. The second biggest is cr crops that are used just to feed humans directly, okay? And uh, this is just another diagram. I'm not going to get into it, but it's just showing, it just shows again that um, animal agriculture is a, is a large part of, um, it's the biggest thing that we do with land use and the biggest thing for, um, in terms of all the materials that we harvest from the environment, it has, it has a you know, very, very large impact. So basically, you know, land use, by that inefficiency, you know, animal agriculture is the single largest cause of deforestation, rainforest loss, wetland loss, and loss of grand, grasslands worldwide. Okay, grazing, 20% of the land, uh, world's lands are degraded by grazing, okay, and 10% by growing crops for animals. So, um, now, of the animal areas that are used for grazing, about 70% of those lands are degraded, especially in dry areas. 
So when animals graze the land, they, they eat the, the grasses and plant in vegetation there, and they eat it down to such a low level that it basically degrades everything, and they trample the land, and they drive off other species that are naturally present, and so forth. Okay, so grazing has a big impact. A lot of times, we sort of, you know, people who eat animal foods, they idealize grazing as this sort of ecological kind of picture, but it's, it's not, okay? And Amazon, you know, or rainforest destruction, you know, grazing and soy production is the biggest reason for uh, destruction of the rainforest, but that's for world, you know, that's for forests around the world, actually, okay? Especially when they're expanding animal agriculture. Um, and so they will cut the forest down and grow soy over there, or they'll plant some kind of grasses or have some kind of grasses they'll grow that animals will graze on, all right? And it's a worldwide number one cause of soil erosion. So why does soil erosion occur? Because when you deforest or you drain the wetland, now the soil is exposed. And that soil can now blow away if you're just growing some grasses and things like that there in those areas that are not, you know, that are not normally grasslands. That type of soil will erode by wind and water and rain and work its way into rivers and lakes and eventually you know, cause problems in those lakes and rivers and then go down to the ocean. Okay? Compaction by hooves of animals. Okay? Animals eat the grasses very low. They're not the same as the natural animals who live in areas, even grasslands. They will, they will consume you know, sheep and cattle and stuff like that. They will eat grass much lower than what the natural animals would. Okay? Um, the replacement of grass by different species of grass you then you have this uh, water wind erosion, um, and uh, then you get desertification. Okay, the worst form of erosion is when you get complete sort of loss of soil or almost total loss of soil, and then you turn areas that were once you know had vegetated into areas that are pretty much desert almost. Okay, and also you know when we farm, when we cut down, we we take natural ecosystems and replace them by farmland to to then feed humans or feed animals. That also results in a certain amount of erosion as well. Okay. Um, different species have different impacts on soil and water. Goats and sheep are generally the worst. They eat the grass the lowest. Okay. And a lot of that soil finds its way into waterways, as I mentioned. Okay. All right, so water use. Now, why is animal agriculture the bigger, biggest use of water? And that is because when you're feeding animals, um, you know, when you're feeding them, you have to grow that food. To grow that food, you need water. And these crops take a lot of water, basically. Then there's also the water that you use for uh, the animals drinking and things like that as well. And we get water from different areas. We get it from rainwater, from aquifers that are underground that built up over many years, and lakes and rivers as well. So these, these sources like aquifers and lakes and rivers, you know, when you're inefficiently growing food by feeding it to animals and then feeding it to humans, you're using a lot more water. Okay, and again, it depends on, you know, the water use is different depending on factory farming, grazing, and stuff like that. In different areas, it'll have different impacts, but the net use of water is, is, is a lot. But the other source of water pollution is that when we use fertilizer in, in those things to grow food, either for humans or animals, but as I mentioned, 50% of the crops are fed to animals, nitrogen, and especially the nitrogen and phosphorus, the fertilizers, they work their way, you know, they, they run off into water systems and they get into fresh water and pollute the fresh water and have various impacts and eventually into the ocean and have various impacts in the ocean. From the stool, the fecal matter, when you have, like, as, I'm, you know, as I showed you before, the livestock that we have far outweighs the, the mass of humans that we have on the earth and they're eating a lot more food, therefore they're producing a lot more stool. And our stool, you know, our food, you know, is, goes into our sewage systems and is processed and, and goes to like landfill or different things happens to it. But, the, you know, for livestock, that's not true. And most of it eventually works its way into water systems or into groundwater and eventually causing all kinds of pollution of groundwater. And there's these huge reservoirs of animal poop and they, and the feces, you know, are responsible for a lot of water pollution, okay? And you have these dead rivers and lakes and coastal areas because of the uh, fecal matter running off to these areas. Okay. Um, okay. Now, because we're losing so much forest, losing wetlands, losing grasslands, the species who normally live there are driven away, displaced, trampled, or killed, basically, by the animals that we use. So a third of the earth is used for animal agriculture. Then, basically, you know, species in those areas... You know, uh, are impacted, and this is the single biggest cause of species extinction worldwide. Okay. Um, 
there's, you know, this is a reference from Tony Weiss, he's an, another scientist, but you know, 14% of all birds are at risk of extinction currently, 21 to 36% of all mammals, 30, 56% of all amphibians. And the largest animals, the megafauna, the things like elephants and all these animals are the most, you know, elephants, tigers, lions, they're the most impacted by humans taking over land. Um, all right. So now diseases caused by animal production. I talked about in this in my last speech. Um, so when we, when we grow all of these animals in factory farms, it's very intense conditions and many animals don't survive. They get all kinds of diseases. They pass diseases between each other. To get them to survive, people give antibiotics to animals in factory farms. And when, animals are, sorry, and when antibiotics are used all the time, the bacteria and whatnot develop resistance against those antibiotics. So more than half of the world's antibiotics are used in factory farms, in animal agriculture. And therefore, it's a big source of antibiotic resistance that then comes back and affects humans. Because those bacteria with resistant genes, you know, then go back into human society and, and cause a lot of antibiotic resistance there. And that's a big problem. As a physician, you know, who, are treating who treats infectious diseases, sometimes developing countries or even back in Canada, you know, when we, have, we treat something and there's resistance, uh, uh, you know, much of that is because of the use of, you know, of, of animal agriculture. Okay? Now, other things like uh, the flu, influenza. Influenza, when you have these animals all together, especially in, uh, in eastern countries, they're passing viruses amount, around with each other. These viruses mutate, and the flu eventually jumps into humans every year, and there's a new strain of flu that comes from the, uh, factory farms in eastern countries, and then infects humans and spreads across the globe. And we have the flu shot every year, which is, you know, scientists sort of try to predict what the mutation and the genes of that flu are going to be by the time it comes to, let's say, uh, Europe and North America, and we design a flu vaccine. It's not always that accurate, but that's the flu. And the flu, in fact, you know, sometimes just gives you the flu and you're, you know, sick for a few days. But for some people, it causes a, a fatal disease as well, especially people with a weakened immune system, but sometimes even in healthy, healthy people, okay? And then there's things like the swine flu and avian flu, which are more dangerous forms of flu, okay, which are generated in these types of uh, animals and have certain genetic variations that make them more infective and more dangerous to humans. SARS, does people, do people remember SARS, if, you know, quite a few years back? That's the coronavirus, again, uh, from, I think it's mainly from China, the, the, these, you know, pig farms, and it becomes a biogenerator for this type of virus that jumped into humans and eventually killed a lot of people, made a lot of people sick. Salmonella, Shigella, E. coli strains that are dangerous for diarrheal illnesses, and some of those strains can actually cause uh, kidney disease and kidney failure in people, like E. coli 0157, and uh, that um, can you know, cause uh, fatalities as well amongst humans. And through the bushmeat trade, so things like HIV comes from SIV, simian, simian immunodeficiency virus. So, you know, monkeys like chimps had a certain type of virus that was pretty much Close to the, closely related to HIV virus. And through hunting and harvesting these animals, you know, people sometimes get injured and they may get contaminations from blood of an animal or may get bit by an animal. And somehow that virus worked its way into humans and has caused worldwide you know, suffering and devastation. But it is from animal agriculture or animal eating animals that it originally came to us. And Ebola, uh, the reservoir, natural reservoir, is in uh, some of the primates in uh, African countries as well as uh, bats. And when people are hunting these animals or harvesting these animals, sometimes that virus mutates in such a way, jumps into humans, and then causes these diseases in us. And of course, there was a big problem with um, Ebola over the past couple of years um, as well. Now that's land animals. When it comes to the fish in the oceans, the United Nations estimates that fish in the oceans will be pretty much gone, more than 90% gone by 2050 at current fishing rates. Because we are so powerful, I was mentioning how much you know, fish we eat, how many fish we eat. Um, and there's a lot of bycatch fish that are not necessarily edible by humans or it's illegal. So what they do is they catch these fish, but they throw them out so, so they don't get caught. You know, and nobody monitors any of these things. Have you heard of dolphin-friendly tuna? Yeah, it's, it's just, that's nothing. They just write that on the label, but there's no such thing as dolphin-friendly tuna, tuna. They may use some slightly different techniques, but there's nothing that's dolphin safe or that saves any dolphin lives. Um, you know, and we basically fish everything out of the oceans. And, um, and, and, and so uh, <coughs> fish, consumption, fish consumption is a huge thing, but um, also people hunt sharks. 
and there's less than 10% of the original population that's left now. That's through shark finning, but also just fishing, you know, ends up scooping up a lot of sharks. And that's the biggest killer of whales currently. You know, there's people who hunt whales, but the biggest killer of whales is whales just getting caught up in fishing nets and so forth. That's still the biggest. Now, people used to hunt whales in the ocean, and we're down to like probably less than 1% of the original population of whales in the ocean from what there naturally was, let's say, hundreds of years ago. That's how much we've skimmed that population. And birds, mammals, and all ocean life get caught in fishing nets. All right. So fishing is a huge thing. And so we talked about bycatch, you know, being whales, turtles, seabirds, and all these. Okay. And you know, humans are powerful. When we go fishing now, you know, we use sonar and all kinds of things to, and, and GPS and satellites to locate the massive schools of fish. And then we target them with these modern fishing techniques that scoop up just entire schools and, 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 and massive populations. Okay. And the ocean, you know, which is you know, equally biodiverse or perhaps more biodiverse than life on the land, is even, is even f in more rapidly threatened uh, as an entire biome, not just ecosystems, all ecosystems in the ocean, the entire biome is threatened. Okay. And then there's these things that come out and say, you know, omega-3s are good for you, and people start eating fish more, and it speeds up that process. Okay. Fish farming, people think that, hey, well, this is going to be good. But really what they do is they catch a whole bunch of fish that people don't want to eat, grind them up into pellets, and then feed them to other fish. So it actually has a bigger impact because there's that feed conversion ratio. You know, you're going to feed X number of kilograms of wild caught fish to the fish that people preferentially want to eat. And then, you, you know, you're, that, those fish are going to use for their own metabolism. And they say that the feed conversion ratio is really good, like maybe 2.5 kilograms of, you know, wild caught fish gives you one kilogram of... Um, of the fish that you're feeding, but those are in many cases overestimates uh, of the feed conversion ratio. It may be much more like four kilograms or six kilograms. And these aquaculture, when they have these huge areas of the ocean where they put a big net and they grow these fish in there uh, that are fed for, you know, and contained, and then we use those, uh, you know, then we, and then we feed them wild caught fish. Um, underneath that, you know, there's all their waste that is produced because they're in a certain area and it kills the ocean floor and, and causes all kinds of damage to local ecosystems as well. Now, when it comes to climate change, I put climate change at the end because climate change isn't just the most important environmental problem. Land use change, soil erosion, all of the water pollution, these are all massive environmental problems. But we're always focused on climate change. Climate change is more a result of the other things that we do than a cause of the other things we do. Okay. Livestock's long shadow pinned the number of the, the climate change uh, number to 18% from animal agriculture. It says, eight, you know, animal agriculture causes about 18% of all global warming gases. That's CO2, um, but also methane and nitrous oxide. Okay. Um, and that includes basically, and that's mainly, the main cause is basically deforestation and wetland loss. So when you cut a forest, down or drain a wetland, the biomass that's there, the natural plant biomass, decomposes or sometimes is burnt, and that releases CO2 up into the atmosphere. Okay, because you have to, you know, all that plant matter is going to go. All right, and so you're having this huge carbon reservoir, which is now liberated into the atmosphere, and that's the biggest cause of climate change from animal agriculture. Also, uh, there is, you know, various animals. So from the stool and feces of animals, you have uh, nit nitric oxide and uh, methane off-gassing from that, as well as ruminants like cattle, basically they burp. It's not their farts, it's their burps. As the enteric fermentation happens, they ferment in their, in their guts, and then they release these, um, you know, methane and whatnot. So that's, you know, how you get all these climate change gases coming from animal agriculture and having such a big impact. Um, now, the number 18%, you'll also see 12%, you'll see 8%, 10%, you'll see 25%, you'll see 51%. They, they have different ways of calculating these numbers. But if you take everything, basically the, the off-gassing from fecal matter, the gas, you know, methane from ruminants, you get the um, deforestation and decomposition of plant matter from all that kind of stuff. Then, if you add it all together then it comes to about 25%, according to the United Nations 2012 document called uh, Growing Greenhouse Gases Due to Meat Production. That's the latest United Nations number. It's not coming from some other organization that, you know, is an animal rights organization or somebody else. You know, it's coming from them, which is a pretty conservative organization, and they're not biased by things like animal rights or anything like that. That's just them, okay? Now, there's another... Uh, 
organization, you hear the number 51% thrown around, and that comes in the movie Cowspiracy. And they also include the CO2 caused by the breathing of animals, and have revised calculations for some areas of deforestation which were undercalculated, and undercalculation of methane e emissions and nitric oxide emissions. You can calculate the impact of these things in a, in a different way. Um, and so different organizations do it differently. But if you calculate it according to different ways, it comes up to 51%. Now, I personally just don't include animal respiration because I think that's part of a carbon cycle. Now, I don't want to get into all that, but I don't include the breathing of animal. But if you look of animals, but if you look at their data and you calculate the other numbers, you use the other numbers they use, uh, you know, ex excluding the breathing of animals, that number comes up into, you know, 30 something percent of climate change gases. So between 25, 30 something percent is probably, you know, where um, the contribution of animal agriculture is towards climate change gases. And the interesting thing about that is that, you know, the total number of all transportation combined, planes, trains, automobiles, if you look at the CO2 emissions from them, then that adds up to maybe, you know, 12, 13, 14 percent maybe. Okay, so animal agriculture vastly exceeds all forms of transportation. Now, on a per person basis, right, on a per person basis, um, a, a person eating meat and driving a car, their car emissions may still be higher. But if you average it out over humans, all humans, because many animals who eat meat don't have a car, then the animal agriculture is higher. So, cars and things like that, if you can't tell somebody that your diet causes more climate change than your SUV, no. The SUV will, on a per-person basis, cause more climate change gases. But in terms of net humans, uh, the uh, animal agriculture is worse. Okay. Um, yeah. All right. So we talked about uh, some of these climate change gases, CO2. Methane is 23 times more potent than CO2 in terms of climate change gas. And uh, nitric oxide is you know, almost 300 times more potent than CO2. But these things don't persist necessarily in the atmosphere quite as long, and there's, there's just different factors in terms of their calculating their impact. Okay? And climate change disproportionately affects people in developing countries or lower income countries, and disproportionately will affect future generations. So people who are not yet born are going to suffer the greatest uh, amount from the environmental impacts that we do now, climate change and the other things that we do. All right. We talked about food justice, right? 90% of the world's soy, 30% of the world's grains, and 50% of total crops grown are fed to animals. So when we talk about world hunger, food security, feeding the growing human population, you know, this, these are big food justice issues. And there's places on Earth where people are starving, but they're exporting food out of those same countries. Okay, so uh, Ethiopia, so, so many years ago when there was a famine, they were actually exporting food. And they're exporting, a lot of these, in a lot of countries are exporting food. They're exporting food to then, in many cases, feed to animals that will then, you know, be fed to humans. So that's one of the major reasons of exporting food. And when we export food from developing countries, we're also exporting water because they had a certain amount of water. Much of it was used to grow that food, and then we export that food. So that's kind of a virtual water export. It's just like exporting water out of the country when we, when we export food out of the country. So that's kind of like a virtual water export. So that's also depleting water resources in developing countries as well, as well as, you know, um, uh, developed countries too. Now, plant foods are also a, a source of environmental problems in some cases. For example, palm oil, which Cowspiracy sort of minimizes the impact of palm oil, but it's, but it's very big. Okay, and other foods where, you know, now things like avocados, because the world is eating avocados and they've grown mostly in one certain place in Mexico, it's having a huge impact on the ecosystems over there. And um, things like chocolate, where there's a lot of slavery and, you know, human abuses involved in controlling those lands and controlling the populations to produce chocolate that, to then feed people around the world. So even foods that are plant-based can be very detrimental for human rights and whatnot as well. So I want people to be aware of those things as well. All right. So, but, you know, those are, those are things that we can, we can also um, learn about and, 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 and change too. You know, because when we talk about veganism... For ethical reasons, we want to think about all these things together, right? So if I'm eating chocolate that's grown by a slave, to me it's not really vegan, right? And, uh, you know, so I'm not perfect yet, but I've eliminated, let's say, most of the chocolate that I eat that's, like, not fair trade. And there's something called the, um, the, there's a, something called the chocolate list uh, by the Food Empowerment Project. Somebody who spoke from there today, okay? And, and there, she's, that's a great organization. They have a great list of organizations that provide chocolate that is, you know, free of human rights abuses, most likely, okay. Now, when we talk, when you see things in the media, right, you know, the media is very biased in general towards animal agriculture and animal-based foods. In general, it is, I think. And 
they say, oh, you know, like if I'm going to grow lettuce, you know, it takes this much water. And how much lettuce do I have to eat to get enough protein to match a steak or some chicken or something like that? So obviously vegetarianism or veganism isn't very good for the environment. But, you know, most of their comparisons are kind of like, they're kind of bollocks. I don't know if I'm going to get in trouble for saying that word, you know. But they don't, they're, they're not fair comparisons. Because what you have to do is you have to compare those to the protein-based plant foods. Specifically, especially the pulses, the beans, lentils, legumes, soy, and all that kind of stuff, those are the heavy hitters of protein foods. And they cause, you know, they take a minuscule amount of, you know, less than 10% or less than 5%, even sometimes close to 1% of the resources to grow the same amount of protein and calories as it would to grow the equivalent amount of meat. Again, depending on the type of meat you're eating or the type of animal food that you're eating. But in, in Universally, they have they require much less water, much less land, and not only do pulses um, grow well, they grow well in all kinds of conditions. They don't require refriger refrigeration. They're easy to transport. They have all kinds of qualities that increase their sustainability, um, and they're also really, really healthy. They decrease, you know, rates of cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and everything as well. So it's like a win-win-win situation, and that's what we should be con comparing when we compare. You know, when you see in the media meat compared to some other food and the impact, if they're not comparing them to the pulses, then they're not making a fair comparison, okay? 2016 is the International Year of the Pulses according to the United Nations. The United Nations is starting to realize the, the, the benefits of plant foods. And that's what they've, you know, now I don't think it's really widely spread or anything like that. There's a big celebrations or parades in the street about, you know, beans. But uh, that's what the United Nations declared because people are starting to get smarter about the fact that this is a way to feed people sustainably and in a more healthy fashion as well. Okay, so lentils, legumes, beans, and soy. Soy is just a bean, okay? And it's the highest protein and uh, has lots of uh, research behind it in terms of uh, de decreasing cancer rates, decreasing heart disease, increasing bone strength, and you know, a lot of things. You know, and these myth myths about estrogen are not true. So I, I promote uh, soy foods, but you don't have to eat soy. But all foods from the pulses and lentils family are really, really good for you. Okay? And whole grains as well. Whole grains and also things like quinoa and whatnot provide a lot of protein as well. You, know, you can compare animal, uh, you know, meat production to whole grains as well the ratio isn't quite as spectacular as it is for pulses, but again, there, there's, there's a better ratio, okay? All right, so when we compare meat to almonds, lettuce, palm oil, oil, and avocados and stuff like that, that's not fair comparisons, all right? Now, there's a lot of things about, have you heard about locavores, people trying to eat the 100-mile diet, grow things within 100 miles and eat from that, and that's supposed to be sustainable? Have you guys heard about that? Okay, that's a big deal like in North America, especially in Canada where they designed this idea of the 100 mile diet. If you can eat things locally, then that means that there's less transportation of all these foods and probably you're more sustainable by eating locally. But it's more complicated than that because some foods grown locally may have a higher impact than a food that you can grow somewhere else and bring it into your country or from further away. Okay, like growing tomatoes in a greenhouse in Canada in the winter may be having a higher impact than transporting that tomato from somewhere further off, but you're transporting it over, and also then taking foods and sending them back there. Uh, but as I mentioned, animal agriculture exceeds, you know, the climate change gases from animal agriculture exceed all forms of transportation. And there's also, a, and it's only a small percentage of total transportation, total mechanized transportation that's actually used for foods. Most of our transportation is just driving around, flying around for other reasons, transporting other goods and, and things like that. So food transport is a small amount of the total transport. So obviously transportation, we can look at that, you know, transporting food over long distances as part of its environmental impact. But an animal agriculture still, in terms of climate change, far exceeds you know, the, the problem of transporting plant foods. But fairly, you know, we transport animal foods quite a lot as well, okay? And um, in Canada, they came up with this idea of the 100-mile diet and it became very popular in Canada. And so they said, well, in Canada, you gotta eat meat because we have a winter and what are you gonna eat in the winter? You're not gonna eat vegetables, you're gonna, you know, you're gonna eat meat. So obviously, it's kind of like, again, biased towards, um, it's biased towards animal foods, this concept. But it turns out that Canada is the second largest grower of lentils in the whole world. And that's never mentioned, because within 100 miles, they're growing lentils actually too. So with a fraction, fraction. So you can see how these many environmentalists are neglecting the idea of plant foods. And, and uh, even in Canada where they came up with this concept. All right, so it's kind of ludicrous. Global conflict, there's a lot of wars in various countries, okay? Um, 
where climate change is a factor and food security is a factor. People are fighting because there are certain areas where you can grow food, you can have water, and they're impacted by people's populations exploding and also by climate change and other factors. And then people are fighting, you know, environmental in impacts are a part of it. And as time goes on, we're going to have more global conflicts that are going to be caused by environmental impacts and animal agriculture is a big factor in this. And all of these, in many sort of uh, Middle Eastern countries, we've had this sort of, you know, what they call the Arab Spring and so forth. And there's all kinds of, you know, social injustice and political injustice that's a part of it and, and also, you know, uh, long-standing disputes that people have based on various factors and, uh, you know, uh, social factors, religions, whatever. But climate change was also a factor in this and that's something that people don't mention. Population increase and climate change impacting people's ability to grow enough food in those areas and that means higher food prices, scarcity, and then leading, uh, becoming a factor in the conflict there. So food security, climate change, animal agriculture, these are, you know, you know things that are happening uh, interrelated with each other and uh, a part, you know, of the problem of global conflict as well. Okay. So I'm coming back to this slide. I think we've gone through most of this stuff. Animal agriculture being a uh, number one cause of so many of these environmental problems. Okay. And just, you know, uh, I, got, I guess I got to use the word intersectionality at some point, you know. But when, when we talk about... Um, when we talk about plant-based diet, you know, there is human health, but there is also a lot of things about justice towards humans, sustainable development, environmental impacts, you know, ethical treatment of animals, all of these things, you know. And, you know, Einstein said that, you know, our task must be to free ourselves by widening our circle of compassion and embrace all living creatures in the whole of nature and its beauty. Nothing will benefit human health and increase chance of human survival for life on Earth as much as the evolution to a vegetarian diet. You know, these are words by Einstein because he's talking about the combined effect of what we do when we eat animals. And also the fact that when we're able to sort of eat animals, we're able to turn our compassion towards other living beings on and off. And we will learn, when we learn to turn our compassion on and off, we then you know, be more, become more accustomed to doing that amongst humans themselves, you know, and towards the environmental and the, the environment and whatnot. So, um, you know, that is a, is a major uh, part of human psychology, that when we, when we behave in certain ways, it affects our psychology and makes us more capable of rationalizing violence towards humans and all kinds of things that we do as well, all right? Um, so, uh, I'll, let's see. Um, and that's, I think that, that's the summary, okay? It uses more, animal agriculture uses more land, more water. It's a less efficient f form of food production. And it's one of the biggest causes of global warming, biggest cause of loss of uh, bio biodiversity worldwide. And there's a lot of diseases that also in, in impacts on human health um, and human conflict as well, okay? And uh, so eat the rainbow, okay? Eat lots of, uh, you know, plant foods from all the different food groups, plant food groups. Is the color working there? It looks kind of green from here. <laughs> my, my slide is very colorful compared to this. I'm not sure why it looks green over there. <laughs> okay, but, um, uh, you know, get food from all, you know, whole foods. Uh, I tell people whole, whole food, low fat, lowish fat, you know, uh, plant-based diet is super good for human health, all right? And you can see my video online about uh, plant-based nutrition. Okay, just go Google my name. Vegan Diet and Health, Dr. Tushar Mehta, Vegan Diet and Health, and look up the 2014 talk, that's the one that's best edited, where you can also then download references about the environmental impacts of animal agriculture, as well as human health, uh, and the sort of the, the, the medical and nutritional references, scientific references for the things I do in that talk, okay? Thank you so much, and hopefully we'll have some time for questions as well over here too.